Let's get started because the struggle for women's suffrage, the history, it's history at its best. Dramatic, surprising, disappointing at times, but ultimately inspiring. As you watch, consider pulling history forward, using the suffragist actions to advance your own goals. Here we go. There we go. Okay. The first Women's Right Convention was held in a small Methodist chapel in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. Its goal was to draft a woman's declaration of independence. And in 1848, the attendees had their work cut out for them. As second class citizens, women's ha women had no rights to own property, no access to education, no rights to the custody of their own children, and no rights to the safety of their own bodies. Spousal abuse was perfectly legal in some states. Women were so confined by law and custom, just a suggestion of women's rights was considered blasphemy. The organizer of the convention was 32-year-old Elizabeth Cady Statton, who'd been a revolutionary all her life, fighting for every advantage afforded her brothers. <clears throat> At the 1848 convention, the group of 300 women and men, largely abolitionists, passed one resolution after another in support of women's rights. Then Staten demanded a resolution on women's right to vote, and she created an uproar. Staten said, nothing short of this right will secure the rights of all others. It was a radical idea. What was at stake wasn't just the right to vote, but a whole system of customs that define men and women's roles in the world. Arguments went on for hours until abolitionist Frederick Douglass rose in support. His words convinced those assembled that a true democracy demanded men and women, black and white, standing united for a better nation. Reaction to the, res the convention's resolution in favor of suffrage was mostly negative but it launched a wave of suffrage meetings that would expand in size and location for the next 70 years. One attendee at an early meeting was a restless school teacher from Rochester, New York, a young Quaker, Susan B. Anthony. She was a terrific speaker, statuesque with a commanding voice that was always dignified and concise. She took her simple message from coast to coast Women must have full rights of citizenship, most basically to be treated like human beings. Stanton was divided between raising a family and raising a revolution. Stanton stayed home, raised six children. She wrote speeches and published articles while Antony became the face of the movement. For 10 years, leaders of the, suff leaders of the suffragists worked with abolitionist leaders like Sojourner Truth. When the Civil War erupted, suffragist leaders <clears throat> saw the promise of independence, not only for black men, but for women as well. However, when the war was over, Anthony and Stanton refused to support the 14th or the 15th Amendment because they did not include voting rights for women. Abolitionists condemned Stanton and Antony as radicals, even racists. Defiantly, Stanton and Antony founded their own organization, the National Women's Suffrage Association. In 1872, they challenged the Constitution. On election day, Susan B. Antony went to the polls and convinced a young male poll worker to let her vote. Later that day, she was arrested at her home for the crime of voting. She insisted on being taken away in handcuffs. The trial itself was a sham. On the first day, the judge entered the courtroom with his guilty verdict, all written out and in his pocket. Eventually, the all-male jury agreed and fined Antony $100. But the judge made one big mistake. 
he asked the accused if she had anything to say before <laughs> sentencing. To the, to the delight of the media, Antony gave the court an earful, once again, raising awareness and support for the suffrage cause. A year later, the Supreme Court ruled that while the Constitution considered women to be citizens, only the states could define their right to vote. Antony said, we must buckle on our armor and battle for women's rights wherever the battle is to be fought. With Stanton's advice, Antony would campaign from Maine to California, organizing and energizing women. After 40 years of campaigning, only one state, Wyoming, entered the nation as a suffrage state in 1890. While most men resisted giving women the right to vote, the realities of frontier life put men and women on more equal footing. If there was any hope for suffrage, it appeared to be in the West. Suffragists in Western states needed organizers, speakers, and literature. The National Women's Suffrage Association sent a tough 35-year-old Iowan, Carrie Chapman Catt. She was the movement's best organizer and a thrilling orator. She famously rode a railroad hand car down a mountain in Colorado in order to make it to a meeting at the bottom of the mountain in time. She said, somehow I arrived hatless and breathless and ready to give my speech. 20 years later, this fearless and determined woman founded the League of Women Voters. Organizers like Kat encouraged Western suffragists to focus on specific groups, laborers, farmers, miners, church organizers, and the, it was the classic political bargain. You help us, we'll help you. One of the most powerful partners was the Women's Temperance Union. Horrified by the abuse women suffered and children at the hands of drunken men, the group's eventual goal was to outlaw the sale of alcohol. So the temperance partnership would also enlist one of the movement's strongest opponents, tavern owners and the liquor industry. Back in 1910, California suffragists employed the same methods as organizers in other states, and they were creative. They traveled in convertibles and spoke from their cars. They created postcards, playing cards, and shopping bags. They had organizers in every part of the state. Maria de Lopez served as a Spanish translator for the movement and was the first woman to give a speech in Spanish in support of women's suffrage. But the tavern owners in the large coastal cities were successfully campaigning against suffrage. Proposition 4 was on the California ballot in 1911, granting women the right to vote. The proposition passed because of counties like Riverside, who supported suffrage and passed the measure by over 500 votes. Wow. But opposition to suffrage nationwide was as stubborn as ever. The anti-suffrage women were society ladies. They believed their ability to shape the world rested in their identity as women. Moral purity came from domestic roles. They became a well-financed national organization and would oppose suffrage to the end. It's too bad, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, that these women are begging to be left in their chains. At the end of the century, a new group of suffragists emerged, African-American club women. They were an elite group, educated and middle class. These women argued that black women needed the vote more than white women because without it, they would be continually discriminated against. Mary Church Terrell was the outspoken leader of the African-Americans Women Clubs movement. She was an educator and a reformer and one of the few African-American suffragists that Susan B. Anthony asked to speak at events. Terrell pleaded with the white suffragists to include injustices against black women in their lists of resolutions. But Terrell's plea found little support. 
Suffrage leaders were focused on wooing Southern white women and found it best to abandon their black sisters. <clears throat> the club women did not give up. With the active support of African-American men, they built a movement that would grow to half a million, but they were never find the acceptance among mainstream suffragettes. <clears throat> At the turn of the century, profound change was coming to women's lives. Women had gained rights to education, property, ownership, and custody of their children. Greater numbers were in the labor force and actively participating in progress progressive labor and social reforms. But the suffrage movement was in a rut. Elizabeth Cady Stanton passed away in 1902. Antony followed four years later. The movement needed new, more modern methods if it was to move forward. The answer came from Harriet Blatch, one of Stanton's daughters and a dedicated socialist. She advanced open air tactics, take it to the streets, talk to the people one-on-one, -on -one. better yet, hold a parade. Parades turned out to be a powerful tool, convincing men that women were well-organized, strategic, not frivolous and weak. But as awareness and support grew, so did opposition. Years of progressive reform brought more men to the suffrage camp, but the attitudes of most men had never really changed. Men were fearful and they had good reason. Suffrage was a redefinition of the roles of men and women. Men could see their identity changing and it was a frightening thing. Factory owners who did not want to improve wages or working conditions for women saw an opportunity to play on men's fears and began spending money on this kind of anti-suffrage propaganda. However, the tide was turning in London. The British suffragists adopted militant civil disobedience led by Emmeline Pankhurst, whose motto was deeds, not words. On the scene was Alice Paul, a 22-year-old scholarly Quaker from New Jersey. Paul was wholeheartedly swept into the movement. She was arrested three times and suffered harsh prison terms. She joined other prisoners on a hunger strike and was fed by force. She wrote, she wrote to her mother that she had to be tied to a chair because she struggled as doctors forced a tube five foot long through her nose. One of the results of torture is radicalization. Alice Paul was radicalized. At age 28, she would revolutionize the American suffrage campaign. In 1913, Alice Paul and her friend Lucy Barnes staged a glorious pageant in Washington, D.C., right down Pennsylvania Avenue, one day before Woodrow Wilson was sworn in as president. The theme was to suggest the free woman of the future. It was to be a moving, beautiful spectacle with Washington, D.C. as its backdrop. Some 8,000 suffragists participated, delegations of every kind, progressive men, black women, everyone from coast to coast. As the parade progressed, some of the men began heckling on the sidewalks. They rushed the street, creating a melee of marchers and angry observers. One marcher asked a policeman for help and was told nothing would have happened if you'd stayed home. The U.S. Cavalry was called in to restore order. Not a single rioter was arrested. The riot received national-wide media attention. Alice Paul took advantage of the negative press the rioters received and began organizing efforts to lobby Congress for women's suffrage. One month later, crowds gathered outside the Capitol as a Western senator and Western congressman introduced a constitutional amendment declaring the right to vote shall not be denied on account of sex. Alice Paul named it the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. In 1916, shifts in the political winds equaled hope for the suffrage movement. Jeanette Rankin was elected to Congress from Man Montana. President Wilson announced he would support suffrage, but only by state-by-state -by -state action. 
Carrie Chapman Catt, our lady that rode the rail car down the mountain, became president of the National Suffrage Association. At 57, she was a seasoned and skillful leader determined to organize and unite the suffrage troops in a military fashion. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, Catt advocated that suffragists should do both, support the war and continue to lobby for suffrage. For Alice Paul, there was only one goal, women's suffrage. Her plan? Enlist a perpetual delegation of picketers around the White House six days a week. Initially, they were to remain dignified and silent, but militants escalated the campaign. Banners mocked the president, calling out Kaiser Wilson, who valued freedom for foreigners over freedom for American women. Chapman, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt and the National Women's Association were horrified by the pickets. But worse, the picketers incited violence in some men who found the demonstrations un-American, subversive, and even treasonous. As local law enforcement looked the other way, the women were frequently attacked, attacks that made front page news. President Wilson decided the women had to go. During the summer and fall of 1917, women began being arrested, charged with obstructing traffic. One group of women would be arrested only to re be replaced by another group that would be arrested as well. Women of all ages were sent to prison for days, weeks, or months. They weren't allowed mail or visitors. Many were at hard labor from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Prisoners reported being fed food with worms and insects, along with rotting horse meat. It did not break their spirit. Many returned to the picket lines and were arrested over and over. Alice Paul was arrested and sentenced to seven months. In solitary confinement, she went on a hunger strike and was fed by force three times a day. 30 prisoners joined her in a strike. They were forced to lie on stone floors, some very ill with high fevers. Authorities only increased their mortality until the women's treatment reached the outside world. The publicity was pervasive. An angry mail began pouring into Congress. Once again, the power of public opinion caused the authorities to give in. All the prisoners were released. In all, 168 women were arrested and tortured for silently picketing the White House. Now, in the fall of 1917, the power of public opinion was solidly on the suffragist side. Politicians were well aware of the increased public support and the big increase in women voters from states that had passed suffrage. The White House, the House of Representatives scheduled a vote on the Susan B. Anthony Amendment for January 10th, 1918. On the day of the vote, three congressmen left sick beds to vote for suffrage. One was carried in on a stretcher. A fourth left his wife's deathbed to vote. That congressman cast his vote and left the House floor to go to the funeral home. A two thirds majority passed, but just by one vote. If just one of those men had not shown up to vote, the amendment would have failed. The amendment passed the Senate in June 1919, again by just one vote. Now, the biggest fight of all, 36 state legislators now had to ratify the amendment. Each time a state would ratify, Alice Paul sewed a star on her victory banner. By March, she had 35 stars. The movement was forced to turn to the South and the state of Tennessee. The quiet town of Nashville became ground zero for an all out political battle by supporters and opponents. One suffragist said that just because you had a legislator's vote in the morning, didn't mean you'd still have it by nightfall. Some felt sure legislators were being bribed by factory owners and the liquor interests. 
having kept a careful tally through the night. Suffragists went to bed the night before the vote, feeling certain they would lose by one vote. Harry Byrne, 24 years old and the youngest member of the legislature, always wore a red rose in his lapel, a signal that he was anti-suffrage. When, when Byrne voted yes, he sent shockwaves through the state house. It took the suffragists a few minutes to realize what had just happened. That single vote was the vote they needed to win suffrage. Everyone assumed Harry Byrne must have been bribed in some way. But no, he'd gotten a letter from his mother, which he carried in his pocket. She told him to be a good boy and do the right thing, vote for women's suffrage. So the struggle for suffrage came to an end because a young man from Mouse Creek, Tennessee, did what his mother told him to do. 20 million Americans had won the right to vote. Carrie Chapman Catt wrote, this vote is won. For 72 years, the battle for this privilege has been waged, but human affairs with their eternal change move on without pause. Take no pause, act, and that is progress. But as you know, there is so much more for us to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Women are now the most powerful voting bloc in this nation. We hope you will join the League of Women Voters in staying informed on the issues and join us in voting this year. So thanks to the Riverside County Law Library for the opportunity to share this with you. There's our resources. I turn it back to Jenna. Thank you, Joan. That was such an exciting story. Um, you're, <laughs> you're welcome. I did not realize how close the votes were of that just one away for like every time it was voted. Every time. It was a nail biter. So now I can open up the floor if there's any questions that anyone has for Joan or questions for me about the library. You can either put it into the chat or you can ask it um, by unmuting yourself. And unmuting, you can hover your cursor towards the bottom of your picture and hit the microphone. And if it's not read, you are unmuted. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. I'm actually a BSW um, undergrad student from La Sierra University, and um, we are actually um, looking to gain internship hours. Um, and so this was this was awesome um, to see social work happen um, with women. I'm really super grateful that you guys announced, you know, did everything you could to announce, you know, just everyone to have the opportunity to be able to see this and to hear it, listen to it. Um, I was wondering on your last slide, you had an image. Um, I think maybe it was like a documentary or was it a book? Yeah, yes. We we owe our biggest debt of gratitude to it was it's a it's a PBS. Uh, it was on American Experience. And it was like 15 years ago. But it's called One Woman, One Vote. And I relied on it heavily for the timeline to um to, to get this produced, to get it out. Um, the, the video is almost two hours. So there's much more detail and um, it's just beautifully done, but it's called One Woman, One Vote and it's available at Amazon. Awesome, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I just put the link to it in Amazon or, or okay. Amazon link in the chat. And I'm also putting in the chat information about our Law Day essay contest for uh, high schoolers grades 9th through 12, 9th to 12th grade. So are there any other questions, comments? I wore my sash. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. This is Victoria. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Joan, for doing this uh, for our patrons and those who are interested in this topic. It's really amazing. The story is very inspiring, to say the least. It is. So 
um, I'm kind of getting emotional here, but I really um, inspired to even join the, the League of Women's Voters. So I'm wondering what is the most challenging task that you are faced with uh, today? Um, uh, our, I think our most challenging task right now, um, because we are all about voting and uh, free and accessible uh, elections. And so this was back in 2011. The um, Supreme Court basically gutted the Voting Rights Act. And it, in fact, as soon as the judgment came down where they took away restrictions that had been on states, that's mostly in the South, who um, in the past had uh, basically, oh, he had, um, tried to stop uh, everyone from voting, you know, racial tactics that they use, the poll taxes and so forth. Well, the Supreme Court took away uh, things that had helped stop that. And that very afternoon, you had states like Texas who went out and immediately started enacting like voter ID laws um, or making it more difficult to register to vote. We always battle every year, they just shutting down polling places. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's difficult to, um, for us to really try and get this fixed because we need, we need Congress to uh, come back to this because they have the power that they can fix it. But um, we're sort of at a stalemate now. So um, that's, that's really, that I think that's our biggest problem currently. Um, because, you know, the problems now are this, the new fad seems to be in uh, voter restrictions is purging. Mm -hmm. So you have people who go to the polls to vote thinking they're a registered voter and for whatever reason their name has been purged and they're handed a provisional ballot, <clears throat> which they vote on, but it's never counted. Yeah. So there are just tons of issues around that, uh, that, that we keep sliding away and we're, and we're nonpartisan. We don't, we don't endorse parties or, um, candidates. So we trust in the American people to pay attention, to get well-informed and make their best choices when they go to vote. Thank you. Sure. I just wanted to share something that's from the American Bar Association's um, website. It's a mm -hmm. statistic and it says, as of 2018, there were uh, 81.3 million women registered to vote in the United States. They make up 53% of the entire electorate. There you go. So you can imagine if <clears throat> they weren't awarded the right to vote, that's more than half of the voters in 2018 right. were women. And you know, this is a fun fact that's neither here nor there, but the first president that women are credited with electing was Bill Clinton. <laughs> and then we turned out and voted for Barack Obama twice. So we were credited with pushing those candidates to the finish line. Hi, this is Diana. And I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you first and foremost for the presentation and for bringing to light the hardship, but more importantly, the victory. And also, and also, um, thank you for your time and, and your devotion for what you do. Oh, sure. Now, this is my play. I'm just hopelessly devoted to the power of the vote. I don't know why. But um, I know, you know, and when, when we unfortunately the corona, the coronavirus shut us down, just as it because we were planning to do this at all different kinds of community groups because we thought, oh, we'll we'll do like the suffragists, we'll get out there and we'll take the message to the people, and then of course uh, that came to a screeching halt. But a couple of the presentations I was er able to give earlier back in January, and asking women or those assembled, you know, what what inspired you most about the suffragists and what they did? And their answer was often just their utter determination, their unwillingness to give up. And they faced horrible obstacles. And it was, they it, never say die, they just kept going. 
And I think, um, you know, it's sort of like, well, that's how you get things done. You just have to stick with it through thick and thin. And they also, though, I have to say, they had a talent for taking whatever had happened to them and working it, leveraging it to their advantage. You know, they made sure when they were attacked in the streets that everybody knew these are men attacking us and um, in that way, encouraging sympathy. And that was how they built, you know, public support. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating story. And again, it just unbelievable dedication by these women. Thank you. Sure. I had another fun fact. The official colors of the formal women's suffrage movement in the United States was gold, white, and violet for give women the vote. And then, uh, like you were saying, the one gentleman that would wear a red flower in his lapel, right. red, was the official, red was the official color of the anti-suffrage movement. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if anybody um, has seen this. I think it's on FX, FX Network. And it's about Phyllis Shafley who came out so strongly against the ERA. And it's interesting in that her, her attitude about being against the Equal Rights Amendment is very similar to the same attitude that the anti-suffrage women had back at the turn of the century, that um, it, it, men were a corruptive influence and that in order to protect women, women at our best, we had to um, safely guard this domestic role that we had because that the domestic role and caring for children, that was what equaled purity and that women getting involved in politics would just corrupt, you know, our, our perfect natures. <laughs> and a suffragist at the time said, well, you know, this is interesting because most of us go home to men every day. If we were going to be corrupted, wouldn't it happen at home and not standing in line to vote? But um, yeah, some some attitudes don't change very slow to change. I was hoping that you could maybe speak a little more on um, Carrie Chapman Catt, who started the League of Women Voters. Um, where was she? Was she based out of Colorado? She no, she she OK, she was originally from I'm not sure where she was originally from. Maybe actually, I'm not sure. I know she was she was married twice. First time she married, um, they moved to California and he left her destitute. She, and uh, I think it's San Diego. And she, for some reason, moved back to Iowa. This time she had a change of fortune. This husband was very wealthy. Um, unfortunately, he passed away, but it left her with this great fortune. And she was absolutely dedicated to the suffrage movement. So she took her money and got out there <clears throat> went wherever she needed to go and just had fabulous organizational skills. She really, um, she, 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 because it was a matter of organizing all these different factions in different states. And um, she just did it in military style and she got everybody to fall in line. And really one of the interesting things is too, by the time uh, it passed the House of Representatives, and then by the time it passes Senate and finally it ends up in Tennessee, there were all kinds of states, all, in fact, all over the nation, except the Southeast, where they had voted for and passed some kind of woman suffrage. Maybe it was just presidential, women can only vote in the presidential race, but almost every state <coughs> except the deep South. And I think the irony here is the mainstream suffragists who, um, tended to diminish the African-American suffragists, didn't really want them to do have anything to do with them. In the end, it didn't make any difference because there was no way that at that time they were Democrats, the Southern Democrat leadership, there was no way they were going to go along. They, would, they just, they were near hysterical about the thought of African-American women being granted the right to vote. Um, and that's the, another thing, though, that I think is um, interesting about our friend Harry Byrne, who stepped up from Tennessee and voted yes because his mother told him to. He didn't he didn't only step up for women, but he really I mean, he let him have it, the Southern Democrats right in the face. This, I mean, he, because this was a tire culture there. And so when he stepped up and voted for 
women to vote that included African-American women, he really stuck his neck out on the line. So um, he was a very brave young man. Oh, so oh, oh, thank you. I see that. So uh, Carrie Ka Chapman Cat was born in Wisconsin and raised in Iowa. So thank okay. you, Liz. Are there any other questions or comments that anybody has? Um, yeah, uh, Joan, I was just wondering um, if you, if there is a, um, a message that you want to send out to our young uh, voters out there, uh, particularly the young women voters, what would that be? Well, I think the first the first message for young people is that that vote their voting block. Um, let's see, it's eight it's eighteen to forty or maybe eight thirty five. They have overtaken the the boomers as far as voting power goes. They are now the largest demographic, and they need to understand. I think they have the power. Mm -hmm. You have the power, and then the question is, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And and you can work through government. You can engage in government, and you you know you'd be surprised at the kinds of things that when you get together, when you are united and you vote, you can make a difference. Um, and and so it's the same issue for women um, because basically I've always felt every issue is a woman's issue. Mm -hmm. So whether it's equal, whether it's equal pay in the workplace, you know, what have you, um, you know, uh, it's just a matter of recognizing your power and grabbing it. Thank you. Sure. So Joan, I don't know if you can see the chat, but Liz shared that um, when she graduated from Cal State University Fullerton, they made replica sashes because um, she was a women's study major. Oh, she said it was a powerful feeling walking across the, uh, the field with her cohort fighting for all the issues that you are talking about right now. So it's just kind of tying that in together of it seems like it was so long ago in the past, but it still has reverberations in today's time and walking across the stage graduating and just I think it reinforces how close that those votes were. They were only one right. off. Right. And I'm sure that we would have gotten the vote eventually, but like when would it have happened if it didn't right. happen then? Right. No, that, that's absolutely true. And it's like, and you like, you look at the situation with the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment now, you know, we have the states, they have the number of states that they need, but there's a sunset clause. So that they so that um, they need to get that taken care of. That has to go to Congress first. They need to remove that so that then they can move forward. Because you know what some people are saying is, well, you know, they only had seven years. It was only it, its shelf life has expired basically, even though Virginia just ratified it. So that's another issue for women. We need to get out and vote, keeping in mind the Equal Rights Amendment. You know, I made my sash. When did I make it? I think it was made for California suffrage. So that's like almost 10 years ago. And um, every once in a while, the women's uh, our uh, march that we have in January, um, me and one other lady is brave enough to put on our little suffragist outfits and parade around. And I know it's I know it's a good thing to do, but boy, I feel it's kind of stupid. <laughs> But um, yeah, I know it's 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 all a, a good feeling, very empowering for women to just think about the kind of things that we can do and what we've accomplished. So I'm thinking ahead because um, we do have an, this is an election year in November of this year, and right. although it's hard to say what it's going to look like because of the the COVID nineteen happening right now, but from the League of um, women voters for Riverside. I know that I read in the beginning that you do public forums. So can we expect the same? And then can you maybe talk about the the structure of the public forums, like how, how they kind of 
proceed or what can person can expect if they attend a public forum? Okay, so um, you mean a forum like a candidate? The candidates like we have a, we're, we're gonna have a mayoral election? Okay. Okay, so what, okay, now see, now this is how we, we almost adapt here. Um, never give up, we'll just take advantage of this fabulous technology that we have. So I can see, I can see like a giant Zoom meeting where we have um, Andy Melendez and Patricia Locke Dawson, and then people can join in and because typically that's the way we do it and just um, let people ask questions. You know, we try to screen the questions before they get asked because, you know, we don't want any questions about colonizing Mars or anything, but um, so we will figure that out, but we will move forward with it. And likewise, any kind of informational meetings, like I'll tell you one thing, one big thing we do um, every two years, you know, we have the California propositions, right? The, our ballot props. And I'm guessing, I think there's gonna be about eight. I'm hoping not more than that. But we, a league always works on the pros and cons. So we can tell you what those in favor of the pro one proposition says and what those opposed say and who's got the most money behind what and um so this year I, we might do a video i kind of hate to do that because you don't get that interaction and you want to get people's questions but we'll just do something like this and just go through each one and then who has a question and then because um i don't know i'm, I'm always curious to know what other people think i just I have a feeling this kind of situation is going to be with us for a little while. I'm, you know, I don't, not an expert. It's just little thing that's things that I hear here and there. So I definitely think we need to plan ahead and start thinking about virtual meetings for everything. Hi, it's it's me again. I, I'm sorry. Um, I don't want to monopolize the question and answer here, but I, like I said, I really was inspired about you know your presentation, and you can count me. And you have a, a, another member for the League of Women's Voters. I mean, oh, yay! And, and so um, I also would like to let you know that I, I'm, I'm I'm so happy that uh, Jenna is working with us. And I know that Jen is a member of the League of Women's Voters, and we would really love to continue partnership with, with you guys, because I, I believe that uh, strongly that our role as the, you know, the, the law library is to inform the public. And, right. and part of that is what better way to do our uh, play our role in this time with, with the election coming up is to help in uh, educating the uh, the public about the the value, you know, you know, like we're celebrating the theme of the National Law Day, which is your vote, your voice, and our democracy. And so, we cannot overemphasize the value of you know the, of your vote, your voice, that, you know, at that especially Absolutely. this story it tells you that only one vote really makes a big difference. You know? Right, that's and true. So, yeah, and so count us in. So if you, you know. I, I'm sure that um, uh, Jenna will be contacting you and, and ask you how we can be um, uh, a partner and be more effective in, uh -huh. in educating the public about this, this really very important topic and very, very timely. Certainly. Good. Yes, we will be in touch. And I should probably tell you, the, the way that the league works, um, our basic setup is, um, well, let's go way back to the beginning when the league first got started. The first issue they took up was child labor laws and compulsory education. So what the women did was they studied the situation. They read as much as they could. This is 1920. And they came to a position which is still pretty much in place. Um, and so then we take that position, well, whatever what we have in place, and we take that and then we go out and that gives us the ability to advocate for whatever issue is uh, being contested. So we stand in favor or against something based on our positions. So we have positions on everything and from the issues with the environment to uh, openness in government, um, that just all sorts of things. 
So um, a real good way to get acquainted with the league is to look at our positions. Um, we're basically, you know, we're, I think we're, we're basically pretty common sense, good government group. Well, looking at time, we're close to four o'clock. We're seven minutes away. So are there any final questions, comments? Um, anything? It can be for Joan or for the library. And I posted again in the chat um, a link to information about Law Day from the American Bar Association and then the library's website and then a link to the League of Women Voters Riverside Facebook uh, page. And I also uh, put in my email if there's any questions that you want to follow up on. So if there's not any, I'll, I'll stay silent for a couple seconds. So if there's any questions. Hey, Jenna and Joan, it's Liz. I don't have a question, but I did just want to give a big shout out and say thank you again. This was wonderful and is making me heinously nostalgic for my women's studies days, as well as <laughs> um, heinously angry for the state of our country. So thank you. It's a good anger. It's positive. So and you all of you who have been commenting as well, it, it brings me joy and it, it makes my it makes my librarian and women's studies heart just swell to hear all the positive um, feedback and what you guys are doing and trying to do. So thank you, everybody. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks. I have to thank Jenna for um, inviting me today because this was my first opportunity to practice doing it this way. <laughs> so now I've got my few. I won't be scared anymore. Now that I've done it one time, I know I know we can uh, we can get out there and spread this virtually. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Joan, for <laughs> to, uh, to take a leap and try technology. And thank you for bearing with us in the beginning of where I was muted. Um, don't know what happened there. So thank you all again for attending. Um, I'm glad that we were able to host this virtually. And hopefully you've learned something new and then can go out and apply what you've learned, maybe encouraging someone you know to vote this, this year or picking up a book that we talked about in the chat. Um, we also, on our social media today, posted some book recommendations for children, elementary school children. Um, that is about voting in women's suffrage. So check that out on our social media, or Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So again, if there's any questions, get a hold of us through our website or call us. And thank you again, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.